Greetings and salutations, everyone. Today we're going to be taking a look at probably the most important, impactful thing that happened in Renaissance Age Europe. That is the artwork. This is some of the best art that the world has ever seen. It was definitely a callback to the classical age of Greece and Rome, and it's going to influence not just the Western Europeans from the 13th through the 15th century, but it's going to influence, in some cases, all the way up to now and beyond. So let's take a look at the art of the Renaissance. We see during this time period the kind of development of art that has been seen. Uh, on the left, we've got a picture of ancient Egyptian artwork. This comes from the tomb of Ramses II. Uh, it's flat. It's two-dimensional. Yes, there are people doing things, but that's all that's going on. It's a very non-interactive piece. While Michelangelo's David on the right is one of the most perfect examples of anatomy, physiology, and, well, art that we have seen from this time period, uh, this person looks like he could start moving, that he could start walking and talking any moment now. One of the big things that we notice in this time is the concept of perspective and where things are in relation to other things. This is the Annunciation from Botticelli. And in the background from the angel, we can see where things are. The concept of smaller things farther away. Background, foreground. It gives a real three-dimensional depth to what you see in the picture. Now, some of this stuff is really resplendent. This is another Botticelli, the use of color, the use of light, the use of everything that's going on in this painting is breathing. Da Vinci's Madonna on the Rock shows human in one of the most common trends that we see during this time in a religious tone. The church was the one that was most often the patron for so many of these artistic themes. And when the church wanted something painted, they usually wanted some kind of religious tendency there. Um, even something as simple as this, there's a lot going on that is seen and understood as a cultural contribution. When the Sistine Chapel was first being created in the late 15th century, the idea of it was a place where cardinals could elect their new pope. And now mind you, they had had places like this before, but when the church came to Michelangelo and asked him, paint this, at first he said no. Um, he said, I'm a sculptor, I'm not a painter. Then they gave him a lot of money and the opportunity to create something amazing. Um, and he did. The Sistine Chapel, the ceiling, and the painting on the far end, which we'll get to in just a minute, is a really amazing example of the detail that went into something as simple as the ceiling. I mean, look up at your ceiling right now. hundred bucks says it doesn't look anywhere near this good. He laid on his back for three years to create this masterpiece. It's detailed. Raphael is one of our other masters. Yes, we're going to do the whole Ninja Turtle run. We've done Leonardo and Michelangelo, so here's Raphael. Uh, one of the things that Raphael was most known for was his self-portraits. We know what Raphael looked like at every stage of his life. This is another Michelangelo. Again, we're looking at artistic concepts. This is uh, La Pietà. This is the descent from the cross. Um, I love this piece for so many reasons. Uh, one, when Michelangelo first bought the stone that was going to be used for to create this, no one else wanted this. That's, that's rock. That's not clay or wood. Uh, that was made out of rock. Um, no one else wanted it because they said, you know, it's too small. You can't do anything with it. And he creates a life-size sculpture. And when you put in all the little folds on her tunic, all the little curls on his hair, this took a level of detail, a level of work and dedication that we don't see at all. One of Da Vinci's more famous paintings is this um, mural. This is The Last Supper. This is what well, depicts 
a more New Testament concept, the Christian Messiah and his last meal while on earth with his disciples. Uh, there is a lot of stuff going on here, and there's a lot of stuff that people want to look for here. Um, some of the table legs don't match up the way they do. There's a few more hands than there should be. Uh, plates, there's, there's some stuff here. If you ever want to see this one, it's in a cathedral in Milan. And it, since it's a mural, it, you know, it, it's on the wall, so it doesn't get out at all. This is by far Da Vinci's most famous piece, uh, the Mona Lisa. It is really impressive. It's an amazing artistic piece. Um, however, the best example of seeing it is probably on your computer or right here. Um, if you ever find yourself in the Louvre, the painting itself is only a little bit bigger than your notebook. It's really small. But it got really famous because it was stolen. It was stolen and it was lost for a couple of years and somebody found it um, in a public bathroom. And that's just adds to the, why was it there? What's going on? But holy cow. More of Michelangelo's freestanding marble statues. This is Moses. Um, again, all the detail that goes into this piece. It's breathtaking. This is the Last Judgment from the Sistine Chapel uh, picture just a few ago. This is at the other end, and this depicts how Christians view the world ends. Um, in the center, you've got the Christian Messiah um, deciding, okay, who goes to heaven, who goes to hell. All around him, there is confusion and panic, and if you scroll down on this, there is earth, which is descending into just utter chaos at this time. We already discussed uh, this piece, so I'm not going to discuss it anymore, but I, I highly recommend, if you ever find yourself in Florence, go see it. One of da Vinci's more famous paintings is this um, mural. This is the Last Supper. This is what well, depicts a more New Testament concept, the Christian Messiah and his last meal while on earth with his disciples. Uh, there is a lot of stuff going on here, and there's a lot of stuff that people want to look for here. Um, some of the table legs don't match up the way they do. There's a few more hands than there should be. Raphael's second major accomplishment, aside from the self-portraits, is his Madonnas. Uh, Madonna being, you know, Virgin Mary plus baby Jesus. He painted a lot of these. These were some of his most prolific pieces. This is his School of Athens. It basically asks the question, if the greatest artists, philosophers, scientists, thinkers of the classical age found themselves in one place, what would they be talking about? What would be going on? And it's one of those great philosophical questions. Uh, in this picture, you can see little numbers over everybody's heads. There was a key that went with this picture saying who was who and who was where. Raphael actually drew himself into this painting. Uh, the little R in the bottom right corner, that was him. Now, the Renaissance started in Italy, but over time it's going to move further north um, for a variety of reasons. One, the plague shows up, it moves people into northern Europe because the cold is going to stop the illness. Uh, two, people are more interested in the art that we're going to see. And northern artists are going to bring with them a new kind of painting style we're going to see. And that's going to be the use of oil-based paintings. These are paints which are much, much brighter in color and can provide a tremendous amount more detail. Um, this is probably one of the more famous pieces uh, from the Northern Italian, uh, the Northern Renaissance movement, Antoloni and His Bride by Jan van Eyck. This is such an amazing piece because of how detailed it is everything Ike put into this. Um, this painting is so complex that, well, one, Ike actually signed his name in this piece. Um, it's above the mirror in the back, and not only did he sign his name right in the middle of a painting, which was absurd at this time, he also painted the entire scene in the mirror. This is by far Da Vinci's most famous piece, uh, the Mona Lisa. It is really impressive. It's an amazing artistic piece. Um, 
However, the best example of seeing it is probably on your computer or right here. I mean, we got in all the little folds. And this is just that. Albrecht Dürer is one of my uh, personal favorites because of his use of oil-based paintings in a vibrant manner. Um, it's, it's surprising, all these colors that pop with the use of oil and the way that they did not pop with the use of acrylic. Now, the Renaissance started in Italy, but it's over time. Raphael is one of our other masters. Yes, we're going to do the whole Ninja Turtle run. We've done Leonardo. Impressive. All the little jewels in this guy's hat, in his sleeve, in his sleeve. Da Vinci's Madonna on the Rocks. These two people, I mean, the guy on the left with no neck, but all the level of armor on that guy on the right. Sometimes they don't need to be big and bright. Sometimes they can show the sallow nature of the world. A gray winter. This is his School of Athens. It basically asks the question, if the greatest... Artists, philosophers, scientists, thinkers of the classical age found themselves in one place. What would they be talking about? What would be going on? And it's one of those great... Raphael's second major accomplishment, aside from the self-portraits, is his Madonnas. Uh, Madonna being, you know, Virgin Mary plus baby Jesus. He painted a lot of these. These were some of his most prolific pieces. It's detailed. Oil-based paintings. Caravaggio is one of my... I know I said this about four or five times now, but he really is amazing. The guy illustrated this kind of artistic style known as Charoscura, where it goes from light to dark to light to dark. And in it, it creates shadow and real life that's going on. Uh, in this one, this is the story of St. Thomas, who, you know, after the Christian Messiah dies, sees him and says, you can't be him, he's dead. And then, you know, puts his finger on the wound and says, oh, this is gross, you are a walking corpse. Okay, we'll move on with that now. This is another Caravaggio with the use of darkness and light to create a very rich scene. Um, this is also very bad. Things are about to happen very bad for St. Peter. He's about to be crucified upside down. When the Sistine Chapel was first being created in the late 15th century, the idea of it was a place where cardinals could elect their new pope. And now, mind you, they had had places like this before. More of Michelangelo's freestanding marble statues. This is Moses um, again. Our last little bit is going to be about Renaissance writers. And these guys start writing in the vernacular. They're not writing in Latin anymore. They're writing in the language everyone else is speaking. Uh, English, French, Spanish, Gaelic, Italian, uh, which is now a discernible different language from Latin. Um, this is probably one of the more famous pieces uh, from the Northern Italian, uh, the Northern Renaissance movement, Arnfeloni and His Bride by Jan van Eyck. This is such an amazing piece because of how detailed it is. Everything Ike put into this. Um, this painting is so complex that, well, one, Ike actually signed his name in this piece. Um, this is his School of Athens. It basically asks the question, if the greatest... Artists, philosophers, scientists, thinkers of the classical age found themselves in one place. What would they be talking about? What would be going on? And it's one of those great philosophical questions. 
Uh, in this picture, you can see little numbers over everybody's heads. There was a key that went with this picture saying, Dante, he writes this crazy book called The Divine Comedy. It's a three-part story, Inferno, Purgatoria, and Paradiso. And in it, it tells the story of a guy who goes to hell and what he sees at the different levels of hell. Then he goes to heaven and sees what that's all about in purgatory. Um, and in it, he describes very detailed, very specifically, what happens at each layer of hell. You know, the first layer is for... Uh, those who aren't committed to anything. The second layer is for lust. They're caught in a tornado. The third is for greed. They're smothered in diamonds and gold and stuff. There's nine levels. I'm not getting into them now, but it is a really interesting story. Oh, look, there they are. I completely forgot. Well, those are the levels of hell. Now, some of this stuff is really resplendent. This is another Botticelli. The use of color, the use of light, the use of everything that's going on in this painting is These two people, I mean, the guy on the left with no neck, but all the level of armor on that guy on the right. We already discussed uh, this piece, so I'm not going to discuss it anymore, but I, I highly recommend, if you ever find yourself in Florence, go see it. Erasmus, his work, Praise of Folly, uh, it's about the importance of reform. We talked about Luther, we talked about Zwingli, Calvin, Henry VIII. These guys reformed the church. Erasmus is trying to do the same thing, only to a much broader social event and a social level. He's saying everything needs to change, not just this one little thing. Machiavelli writes probably the very first political science book in the history of the world. Uh, it's called The Prince, and it says, you know, what should a prince do to get and keep power? Uh, his question he asks early on, is it better to be loved or feared? Now, that's a question that has a lot of answers, and in it, he answers that pretty thoroughly, and he explains what you need to do to keep power, to get power, how you need to use tyrannical brutality, and how you need to govern with a soft hand. In some cases, simultaneously. It's a very interesting. Uh, wow, more on Machiavelli. Here. Last person we've got is Thomas More. Uh, his work is known as Utopia. Uh, the idea of a fictional place where everything is perfect and everything serves the world. Nothing is for themselves. Um, it's a wonderful idea. Uh, questionable, though, is it even remotely possible? But it did give people something to strive for. So... Today we took a look at Renaissance art and artists. We looked at what they did, their major accomplishments, and hopefully how they changed the world around them. You probably saw some new pictures, some new artwork, and you probably saw some stuff that you've seen before. But I hope you learned something, and I'll see you around.